welcome to Den of Tools. Hi, ho guys and gals. It's Red, your friendly neighborhood tool bear, back again here in the old Den of Tools. And today, we're going back in time to discover the uh, the origins of the most mystical of tools that lay the foundations for today's power tool industry. And that is, of course, the invention of the electric trill. But before we jump into that, I want to say a big shout out, a big thank you to today's video sponsor, which is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community that helps you move forward with your own creative learning journey. But we're going to talk about more on that uh, in a short bit. But for right now, we're going to go back in time in the way back machine, if you will, back to 35,000 BC when humans first discovered that by rotating sharp rocks between their hands they could bore a hole in another you know another softer material well let's fast forward that to about 30 about by about 37,000 or I guess about 35,000 years to 1889 and the birth of to what we consider at least the birth of the modern electric drill and that credit goes to James Arnott and William Blanche Brain uh, they were both from Melbourne Australia where they were looking for a way to break into bank safes Wait, what? You're kidding. Really? I thought with Australia, no. Whatever. <laughs> you know, that was disappointing. Anyway, apparently their cover story was that they were trying to invent a better tool for local miners. You know, I thought the whole Australia thing is... Anyway, moving on. Uh, the truth is they were well-known inventors in those times. Much of Melbourne's electrical street lighting, in fact, even their local power stations had been designed by Arnott. And uh, they have gone forward then to find a, a better tool to for the local miners to make their industry progress, to make it move forward. And they came up with the blueprints of what we consider today the modern electric drill. Now, the drill was not what you think of when you think of today's drills, even if its core concepts were the same. This was designed for large-scale industrial mining. It was not a handheld uh, drill, but a large piece of equipment had a sort of tripod base. Uh, they had shielding around it because, it, of course, was brushed. And back in the day, there was big brushes on a big motor, and it threw sparks. So they had to shield it, but they could only cover so much of it because it also had to be cooled and it had to get air to it. So you have this big worrying machine, sparks coming out of it, don't want to get anything into it. Uh, then you had to get power to it. So you had, you know, in a mining operation, active mine, you had a power cord running across the mine. If you've ever seen mines, there's water everywhere usually. And of course, they didn't have insulating materials like they do today. And people were often shocked at how bad the grounding on this thing could be. Yeah, I kid you not. Um, but for all its fault, it did one thing right, and that was it worked. And to be honest, the basic concept, the basic you know, fundamentals of how the modern power drill works have really not changed since then. But you know what has changed? The way we learn. And online learning is quickly becoming a primary source of education and Skillshare is leading the way. Their community allows millions of creative people to join together in learning and even inspiring others. They offer classes on a wide variety of topics in these lessons you will not only learn, but interact through class projects. They're also adaptive to fit your schedule, which is perfect for you know busy tool bears like me. My family's always believed that learning is not a destination, it's a journey, and that you're never too old to learn new tricks. As I said before, they offer a wide array of topics. Some of my favorites are photography, cooking, productivity. In fact, a class that I'm following right now is a productivity masterclass on the principles and uh, tools to boost your productivity by Ali Abdal, a doctor and a fellow YouTuber. And the reason I like this is because time is one thing you can't get any more of. So I'm trying to find ways to make the most of mine. Members get unlimited access to thousands of inspiring ad-free classes with hands-free projects and feedback from a community of millions, all for less than $10 a month. For a limited time, use my link in the description below to get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. All right, now back to the story. And as I was saying, businesses love the idea of the electric drill. But let's face it, it is not small or easy to use. This is a large, extremely heavy tool, and it, it's hard to move around. It, it was harder to use, and what, what businesses need, they need mobility. So just six short years later, Wilhelm und Karl Fein of Stuttgart, Germany, yes, those Feins, decided to steal, <clears throat> I mean, sorry, improve upon the original design by making it a handheld and portable device. This could be argued to be the birth of the current power tool industry. 
At this size, this was something that industry and even local contractors could and would use. However, it wasn't until 1917 that we saw a tool that really started to look like what we consider to be today's electric drill, you know, come about. And we can thank S. Duncan Black and Alonzo Decker, yep, aka Black and Decker for that. They invented the first portable electric drill with a pistol grip and a trigger. The pistol grip made it much easier to maneuver and manage, and the trigger allowed you to easily turn it on and off without taking your hands off the tool. Now, their inspiration for this design, of course, came from their work with the Colt 1911, which was, of course, inspired by the invention of John Moses Browning, patron saint of superior firepower. Of course, the previous designs all required two men to properly operate this, but the new pistol grip design with the addition of the trigger-based power switch allowed it to be safely and effectively used by just one person. This design was an instant success and permanently, has really permanently changed the way drills and many subsequent power tools have been designed since. Now, in 1924, A.H. Peterson developed the hole shooter. This was a lightweight <laughs> Can you hear the air quotes around that? Lightweight drill that could be used by not just a single person, but single-handed even. Sadly, a tragic and totally uh, random fire subsequently destroyed his facility, and shortly thereafter, it was acquired by none other than Milwaukee Electric Tools. Now, in 1932, Bosch released their first production electro-pneumatic drill, or what we might call today the, uh, the hammer drill. Yeah, and, that's, and Bosch has pretty much led the way with hammer drills ever since. Now, in 1935, Milwaukee comes back at it again with their new ultra-small compact 3 8 hole shooter. This was considered to be revolutionary. This is when you first started seeing electric drills in the home, you know, DIYers looking at picking up drills. It revolutionized industry. It was a game changer. Not to be outdone, in 1950, Fine releases their ultra-compact Fine Dwarf handheld drill. Uh, was, it got a patent for its plastic housing, and it kind of set the standard going forward for small, you know, easy-to-use, less expensive drills, shall we say. I won't say cheap, but less expensive. Now, 1961, Black & Decker invents the cordless drill. But it was not, let's say, it, it was not easily affordable. It was expensive. Uh, on top of that, uh, it ran off of a nickel cadmium cell and had a very short runtime and was really only used in, uh, in industrial applications that could justify the cost. Now, 1969, Bosch came out with their <coughs> cordless drill and hedge clippers. And by cordless, it had a cord that ran to that battery pack. Kind of reminds me of the old bag cell phones. Uh, that was a 12-volt lead gel battery in a bag. The battery weighed just a, a, a feather light 12 pounds. The clippers could trim a hedge about 20 meters long before needing to be recharged for only six to eight hours. <laughs> oh, now in 1971, Black & Decker goes to the moon. Yep, Black & Decker in space. They provided hand and core drills for the Apollo program that were used on several missions. Now, I'm not saying the moon landing is fake, but I'm saying that picture might have been. I don't know. You be the judge. But in the 70s, the cordless drills started coming out of the woodwork, so to speak. Many companies coming out with their own versions. There's the Hitachi. Kind of sleek. Kind of like it. But ultimately, it was Makita that was credited with the win on this, as they were the first ones to come out with a truly lightweight, production, affordable, usable, reliable, 9.6 volt cordless drill. I guess the 9.6 volt isn't exactly imperative to this, but it did allow for the lightweight use. And I've seen these on job sites. They were still on job sites when I got started in, in the industry in the, uh, in the late eighties. So it, they've been around the block. I, I owned one myself. Now Bosch comes back in, uh, it was 1984. They released their first hammer drill. Now, sorry, I don't have a photo of this, of course, because it did not make it to photo day and apparently couldn't make the makeup day either. Anyway, in the 90s, there was a virtual arms war, arms race going on in the power tools industry as every company raced to convert most of their tools to cordless and, and try to implement more and more power. And ultimately, the, the takeaway, the heart of, of this, the winner was DeWalt. DeWalt was a brand that was reinvented, came out of nowhere. they have been known for radial arm saws, but were picked up by Black & Decker, I think in the late 60s, rebranded as the black and yellow DeWalt, 
just for this occasion, and they took the industry by a storm. But innovation never rests, and lithium-ion batteries were quickly becoming the new hotness. Many companies claimed that they were the first to introduce the lithium-ion power tool, but only one can claim they got the patent on it, and that goes to Milwaukee. According to Milwaukee, it holds three patents that give it exclusive rights to make, quote-unquote, multi-cell lithium-ion packs that can produce an average discharge current greater than or equal to approximately 20 amps. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> and in 2014, they filed lawsuits against, well, pretty much everyone, at least everyone who was making battery packs, uh, power tools at the time. Now, the first of these lawsuits to really actually make it to trial was the one with them versus Snap-on, and Snap-on got snapped off. They lost that one. Uh, and they lost it in a big way. Now, it did, they were originally, uh, I should say Milwaukee was originally awarded, I think it was close to $100 million, but it got brought down to 27.8, which in the grand scheme of things really isn't that much when it comes to these kind of patent wars these tool companies have. But it was enough, and it set the precedent, and nobody else wanted to fight that battle. And as such, they all pretty much ran up the white flag in unison and agreed to pony up a royalty on every battery pack or tool that they sell that uses this technology. And pretty much that's the state of the in industry right up to today. Now, as to the future, where are we going in the future? I don't know. I, it's, it's hard to say. I think the race for right now in the immediate future is really going to be, uh, again, a power race. It's going to be for more power in a smaller, pa smaller package and will continue to be the main driving force in the industry. The first shots are already being fired now with the introduction of the 21700 uh, lithium ion cell. Now the 21700 uses the same tech as the uh, the 18650. It's just a larger form factor. You see there you see a AAA the 18650 which is pretty much standard in most tools and a lot of, you know, cordless battery platforms in in other technologies as well. And then the the new 21700 next to that. Now, these are already starting to show up in a lot of the higher-end battery packs, uh, especially in the smaller ones. When you see the, the, the small, slim ones with a higher-than-normal battery, that, or I should say higher-than-normal battery life, that is where you're really going to see these batteries start to show up. And they're coming out in, in more and more of these. I, I, I think within the next five years, they, they may end up being the standard. Now, that said, other tool companies are trying to come at this from different angles. Cat Power Tools uh, is marketing their batteries as graphene, but as I touched on in another one of our videos, they're only graphene impregnated components. They're not really expected to deliver much of any real world performance improvements, but but we shall see. I'm, I'm not holding my breath on that one. Now, something that does look interesting is solid state batteries. Samsung's been debuting uh, some of this tech. We're expecting this to come around. We all know that Tesla's working on their, you know, million mile battery and all that and all that technology is going to trickle down into the power tool industry and i think that's where we're going to see our biggest gains now uh, are we likely to see smart drills in the future probably you know we already have some smart technology built into a lot of stuff a lot of impacts have smart uh, sensing technology there's some other you know drills on the market that have some smart technology built into it here or there i don't think i want to see it with the screens here i don't know if i need my drill to be able to play fortnite but you know Going down the future, where are we going to go from there? I don't know. The future of power tools is kind of up in the air. I'd like to see more done with making them small, making them compact, maybe finding ways to, to beef up the gearing, making them more robust. I don't know. What would you like to see in the future of power tools? Why don't you post that down below? Anyway, that's all the bear has for you today. If you like what we do here, why don't you go ahead and chomp the old like button down there. Don't worry. It's gluten-free, trans-fat-free. Uh, I believe it's even keto. And why don't you even consider subscribing and ringing the old bell there. If there's any other history topics you'd like the bear to cover, just post them your ideas down in the comments below. Till next time, you all take care. God bless. And as always, come on, say it with me. Shine on.